Jesse Pollack is a creator of BASE, a layer 2 scaling solution from Coinbase which launched last week. BASE has quickly become a trending topic and a trending chain this summer, attracting more than 200 million of value in its short life. Coinbase is the world's second largest crypto centralized exchange by volume, and now it's moving to the on-chain world, so it's worth watching. In our conversation, we will dive into the origin story of BASE, why opt for a layer 2 and not start a whole new layer 1, why go for optimistic rollups, how BASE is unique in the already crowded layer 2 space, their decentralization roadmap, and more. Before we get into it, let's hear an introduction to BASE from Jesse. BASE is an Ethereum layer 2. It's being incubated by Coinbase and decentralized out over the next few years. Uh, the key thing that BASE does is it lets you run all the same applications that you know and love on Ethereum, uh, but at you know anywhere between 10 and 100 times cheaper price. So that, you know, stablecoin send or the trade or the borrow that you're doing on Ethereum right now, that might cost dollars or tens of dollars uh, or hundreds of dollars in peak uh, kind of demand moments, that's going to cost cents or tens of cents on base. Uh, and so the goal there is really to take this incredible kind of suite of applications that have started being built on Ethereum and make them accessible to everyone. Um, so I think that's the kind of core value prop of BASE. It's bring uh, the on-chain world in a format that everyone can access. Of course, there are already a few uh, layer twos out there. Um, there's, you know, we, we've had uh, the founders or developers of um, many of them, or at least the biggest ones in, in the podcast already. Uh, there's different flavors of them, uh, the CKs, optimistic rollups, and, um, and everything uh, else. So why uh, build yet another one? Like what's what's special about this? Yeah, absolutely. And the first thing I'd say is um, generally our feeling is that it's going to take all of us. Uh, you know, when we kind of started thinking about building base, I think the key insight that we had that led to us building base was um, that there's going to be many layer twos that scale Ethereum, uh, almost like the original kind of Ethereum scaling vision. Rather than there just being one layer two, we think that many of these things are going to kind of work together to po provide more throughput, more capacity to Ethereum and help bring a billion people on chain over the next decade. And so what we're doing here is we're really kind of throwing our chips in. We're saying, hey, let's put Coinbase resources, let's put Coinbase energy, um, and let's put Coinbase users uh, into this new decentralized on-chain economy. Um, and let's do that by building base, uh, which is an open decentralized layer two that's uh, built on the OP stack, which means that it's going to have you know more interoperability and connective tissue with all the other OP stack chains like OP mainnet and Zora and public goods network. Um, and let's use base as a bridge where we can take all the Coinbase users and all the future Coinbase users, move them from the off-chain world on-chain with base, and then support them to go explore the incredible you know, new products, applications, experiences that are being built on base and being built on other layer twos, uh, Ethereum, and, and kind of everywhere else in the on-chain economy. And so that kind of uh, connective tissue that connects Coinbase and the off-chain world into base and the broader global crypto economy, um, that's really the why behind us doing this. It's we want to bring the world on-chain, and this feels like the kind of obvious starting point. Why do you think it'll take many any layer twos to scale Ethereum? Yeah, you know, I think uh, really two reasons. One is when, when we look at um, kind of like the history of decentralization in Ethereum, I think that there's generally kind of like some natural forces that pull apart um, uh, kind of concentration. And so we have the EVM, which is a standard. Um, and that means that it's really straightforward to stand up new layer twos. Um, uh, and it's, it's, you know, gonna, I think, be relatively feasible for us to get interoperability between layer twos, which means that they can actually work together and compose together. And so I think the kind of one of the guiding North Stars for us of why there's going to be many of these layer twos um, is that, uh, you know, it, it's just going to kind of be natural market dynamics where folks want to experiment. They want to start new things. That's going to lead to um, a bunch of these things popping up. And then that's going to lead to a bunch of them growing and them all kind of figuring out how to work together. So I'd say that's kind of like the bottoms up thesis. It's like the technology is there. Uh, it's easy enough to use. And that's going to lead to kind of organic growth of a bunch of these options. Um, I'd say the, the maybe more top down thesis is if you look at what Ethereum scaling strategy historically was, it was um, kind of sharding. Right. You know, you take the main Ethereum chain and you kind of chunk it up into a bunch of chunks. Uh, and then that did lets us kind of have more throughput overall. 
And I think the way we see kind of the ultimate end state is that that's where we're heading, right? Like that's how you scale. You have kind of many of these parallel shards that can work together, each providing their own throughput. And if you think about that kind of original vision, and then you look at the vision that we're describing now with layer twos, I think you'll see that they're pretty similar, right? Whether it's like Ethereum sharding or a bunch of layer twos starting to plug into Ethereum, either way you're doing the same thing, which is that you're kind of adding a bunch of different pipes which connect into the one big pipe of Ethereum and enable more scalability overall. And so that was kind of our insight that there's going to be many of these layer twos. And then I think the question was, how do we contribute to that in a really positive way? And that's what informed our decision to build base on the OP stack, um, which is an open source public good code base uh, that enables anyone to run a chain. Uh, we joined as the second core developer. Uh, we've been contributing already a bunch of you know work on decentralization and scaling and security. Um, and and we're doing that because we want to make it easier for obviously base to you know scale and decentralize and but also so that anyone who wants to stand up alongside us, who wants to work with us to scale Ethereum, um, can do that as well. So we're really excited about kind of this vision of the super chain of many chains, but we're also really excited about doing it in a way where these things can work really, really well together. And how do you think all these different uh, layer twos can um, can connect? Like, how does that look like for the end user? Um, because like the the experience right now isn't the smoothest uh, to like go from Ethereum to layer two um, and then back you have to wait uh, you know uh, sometimes for withdrawals and then to on top of that to have to connect with many different layer twos and have like different wallets and I don't know it's it's just it's it's not um, It's, it's a bit clunky. Uh, so how do you see that uh, evolving? And uh, especially considering that a lot of the um, exploits and hacks that have happened, uh, most of them have had to do with bridges. So it, it's, it seems like blockchains right now aren't very well e equipped to interconnect. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, how, how do you see the space overcoming that? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I think... When you look at um, you know a lot of the hacks that have happened, they're definitely having to do with bridges. But um, when we think about kind of what's the most secure bridge construction, um, it really is the layer two roll up construction, um, and that's one of the big reasons why we decided to build base as a layer two rather than another kind of like layer one. Is that we felt like connecting into Ethereum. Uh, building on the security properties of Ethereum uh, was the way we could kind of get that scalability, but also uh, kind of reduce the overall risk. And so um, I think that's kind of our focus. It's it's building base in a way that, um, you know, inherits those security properties of Ethereum, um, uh, but also lets us get kind of best in class scalability. It makes sense that, uh, that you decided to go for, for a layer two. And it's interesting that It sounds like you may have been considering uh, doing a, a layer one. Yeah, we actually like kind of uh, twice before base, we looked at doing a layer one. So in 2018 and 2020, uh, we considered doing a layer one. And each time we basically um, uh, decided, hey, like this isn't the right thing for the ecosystem. It's going to put Coinbase users and Coinbase on an island. Uh, it's not going to help grow the broader crypto ecosystem. And so, um, uh, you know, that really led to us ultimately focusing in on, you know, on, you know, other products at that time. And then, you know, kind of really in the last couple of years, it felt like for the first time we could really do this in a way that um, would actually connect us into the broader ecosystem by building as an Ethereum layer two um, and do it in a way where building on the OP stack, we could be kind of collaborative and open source and kind of give back all the work that we're doing. And that for the first time really felt like there was like alignment with our values and what we, what we cared about. That's so interesting. I guess like you've talked about this a little bit, but When I get um, just, you know, more of your thoughts on why uh, go with the Ethereum ecosystem. This was a long process that, uh, you know, we had to work through. Um, and we really started this before we even knew we were building a layer two. Uh, and we were really just trying to figure out, okay, where do we build on-chain applications or dApps, decentralized apps? Um, and in the beginning of 2022, we really kicked off a process kind of across all of Coinbase and said, hey, um, Where do we want to build? Uh, we looked at a bunch of different factors. We looked at kind of what did Coinbase products support already. Uh, we looked at where were Coinbase developers organically building. Um, and then we looked at, you know, where are the assets? Where is the activity? Where are the 
um, kind of developers in a broader ecosystem. And kind of across the board, we found that um, EVM, which is kind of the Ethereum virtual machine uh, smart contract toolkit, um, that was the like most adopted toolkit. Uh, it was the one that folks were building with the most at Coinbase. Um, and then from a kind of ecosystem perspective, Ethereum was the kind of largest, richest, um, uh, like most diverse and uh, kind of uh, scaled ecosystem uh, for EVM ecosystems. And so um, those two things, and especially the kind of scale of those two things, the fact that it felt like it was generally like an order of magnitude or two mm-hmm. um, in terms of kind of Ethereum's uh, lead, um, those really pushed us towards uh, kind of leaning in in that direction and making it happen. Makes sense. Um, and then, uh, you know, m- more on kind of the, the different decisions you had to make uh, a- along the way, um, because, you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's Coinbase is just such a huge uh force i guess in in the ecosystem that um it it really kind of says a lot what like what you decide to do so um why why go with optimism like um there's just so much a uh, debate on what mm-hmm. the the best roll up technology is uh, yeah. and um and so many good arguments on each front so so yeah why optimism yeah i mean there were a bunch of different factors um and you know after we kind of made the decision evm and ethereum we then did a second whole process which was like okay now we've picked evm mm-hmm. and ethereum but we know ethereum can't scale kind of for the the scale that coinbase is operating at um where should we focus our efforts on layer two uh and i think the the big takeaway for us was um, you know, there's a lot of incredible teams. We spent time with all of them. Um, there's so much innovation. So much of it is happening in an open source way. Um, and we want to figure out, like, how can we best contribute to that? And so after uh, spending a lot of time with all those teams, I think we um, ended up kind of doubling down and working really closely with Optimism for a few reasons. Um, first, uh, as we started playing around with the technology that powers Optimism, so the OP stack, the bedrock upgrade to the OP stack, um, we found it to be really powerful, um, flexible, uh, built in a way that could be upgraded in the future, uh, for instance, to add ZK proofs uh, so we could kind of get the better security and finality mm-hmm. characteristics of those. Um, and so I'd say that kind of technology uh, was a, a big first reason. Uh, I'd say the second reason was um, the the like uh, way they've decided to license and distribute the technology, the fact that it's MIT licensed fully open source, accessible, forkable, whateverable by anyone. Um, that felt very aligned to the Ethereum ethos. It also let us just get started without having to think about it. We can just build and feel confident that we're going to be able to keep building because of that kind of open, permissive nature of the software. Um, the third big reason was uh, really like decentralization. You know, if you look at Coinbase, Coinbase is like a centralized public company. Um, and that means that um, uh, when we're thinking about Starting an open permissionless blockchain, uh, you know, we we need to figure out how can we complement that, you know, uh, thing that can be a strength, but also a thing that in building a decentralized open blockchain can can be a little bit of a weakness. And so I think optimism and the optimism collective and the work that all of them had done on decentralization felt like such a good complement to us. Um, where Coinbase could bring that scale, Coinbase could bring that like kind of publicly recognizable brand, and Optimism would bring um, you know a lot of the decentralization, the experience with governance, and, and really complement as well. So that was the third reason. And I'd say the fourth reason was um, we had actually been spending a fair amount of time with the Optimism team uh, through our work on EIP four eight four four. Uh, which is an upgrade to Ethereum uh, that kind of increases throughput on Ethereum uh, by uh, creating a new thing called blob space and lowering all the costs of layer twos. Uh, and so um, I think through kind of that work, the work of scaling Ethereum, we'd gotten to know the team and it felt like a really you know strong working relationship. And so technology, uh, open source, decentralization, and team, I'd say those are the four big driving factors. I want to ask you more about your uh decentralization roadmap or, or path. But first, uh, curious to learn more about you. Like what's what's your background? Like what led you to uh, build base? Like were you at Coinbase for a long time before this? Like, yeah, what's your story? Yeah, um, I'm Jesse. Uh, <laughs> I've been working in crypto for 10 years, a decade now. Um, I uh, dropped out of college and started a company uh, back in 2013 that um, built uh, kind of identity and security software and mostly worked with crypto companies. So folks like Bitfinex, BitMEX um, were customers of ours. 
uh, that business didn't ultimately work out. And so that led to kind of an aqua hire process, which led to me joining Coinbase at the beginning of 2017. Um, and then I've been at Coinbase for six and three quarters years. Um, so been a long journey there. Uh, I led all of our consumer facing products on the engineering side for four and a half years. So Coinbase, Coinbase Pro, Coinbase Wallet, built all those teams to a couple hundred people. And then um, after that, I kind of you know said, hey, I want to take a step back. I want to go a little bit deeper in crypto and figure out like, how can I help make the next phase of crypto happen? How do I in- enable like a billion people to come on chain? Uh, and I think we kind of identified this North Star, which was like, figure out how to get Coinbase on chain, figure out how to get our products on chain uh, and use that as a guide for figuring out how to get the world on chain. And that was, you know, has been now two, two and a half years of work almost trying to figure out what that me- meant. Um, you know, it took us a while to figure out that it meant base. Uh, the first year and change, uh, we were not building base. We were building other products, none of which were like caught on or worked or felt like they had the right fit inside the business. Um, and then after a bunch of trying and failing, I feel like we finally like realized kind of, oh, in order to enable that next generation of products, we need a, a platform, a developer platform, a really easy way for Coinbase teams and Coinbase engineers and everyone at Coinbase to build. And if we're going to build it for Coinbase, why, why not build it for the world? Um, and so that was kind of the origination of base. It was like, let's create the, the platform that enables the next million developers to build all those incredible use cases that are actually going to bring a billion people on chain. Okay, so that's really interesting. So the process started within Coinbase um, as, a, I guess, you were, were you looking at uh, dApps, like specific use cases first? And then that led yeah. to no, like, no wait, let's, let's build a platform. Yeah, basically, exactly. We were looking at kind of, we were looking at a few different use cases, one around identity, one around advertising, and one around this concept of a marketplace. And at each point, we, we kind of ran into the same problem, which is like, oh, we want to build this thing, but um, it's going to be too expensive to build it at Coinbase scale. Like we're going to, you know, our users are going to be paying too much money. We're going to be paying too much money. It's not really going to work. Uh, and I think after running into that problem, like three times, it was like, oh, we, we got to go solve that. Like if we can solve that, then everything else will kind of fit into place. Every time you wanted to build those use cases on chain, like you, you were you were looking at specific like dApps that you wanted to make. Yeah, 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 exactly. And we were saying, where are we going to deploy them? How are, we, how are they going to work? How do we make sure they work really well with all the Coinbase products? How do we make sure they're at an accessible price point for our customers? Um, and it just didn't, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't possible. Um, and so we, we said, let's go solve that. Even considering building them on other layer twos, it was still too expensive? No, I think no, I think that there was a, a path. I mean, although I still think all layer twos are still too expensive right now. And that's why I've been working on 4844. Um, I think there's, a, there's another path where we could have um, kind of just chosen to build on another layer two or all the layer twos. But um, again, you know, like we talked about earlier, I think our kind of thesis evolved to, to the kind of point where we were like, um, there's going to be many of these things. And if there are going to be many of these things, Coinbase really investing to contribute to that effort um, and to contribute our resources, contribute our focus um, to scaling Ethereum felt like an important place to start. I think it's it's really interesting what you mentioned before that, you know, Coinbase obviously is a centralized exchange, like a, a company, but yourself and I'm, I'm guessing most people in Coinbase, you know, you, you're believers in crypto and like a decentralized future. So, yeah. um, yeah, I guess like how, um, how do you like deal with that tension? Is it, I, I guess like this is the way just like building like a, the decentralized version of, of Coinbase. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's it. Like this is, uh, we kind of see base as the platform on top of which we're going to bring huge chunks of Coinbase on chain um, and bring huge chunks of the world on chain. And so that's kind of been my, that's been my quest for the last two and a half years. It's like figure out how to do that. And it took us a while to figure it out. And, you know, we haven't done all the hard work. There's so much hard work to do. Um, but it feels like we finally have a, a catalyst, you know, like a, a place to do it and a reason to do it and uh, a platform that we can invest in to make doing it possible. Uh, and that, I think, is um, that's a really powerful unlock. And it's been really cool to see it, um, see that kind of manifest and change inside the company, right? Like when we started Base, everyone was like, what's on chain? You know, what's this thing and how's it fit into it? And now we're like six to nine months later and now everyone's talking about on-chain. 
And everyone's talking about, oh, how can we build this new product on chain? How can we use base in some way? How can we use base to lower our transaction fees? How can we use base to enable this new use case? Like the, having that access and the, like it just being there, I think has been a huge unlock for folks kind of starting to put themselves in the future and starting to think, how can I help create that future? So here's something new. Bumper your assets to defend them from price drops without losing upside exposure. You set a price floor and term length, then lock your tokens into the protocol. When your term ends, if the price has fallen under your floor, you leave with stable coins at the floor's value. Otherwise, you just take back your original asset. Bumper is going live in August, and it's one of the most innovative DeFi protocols for hedging being built right now. So check out bumper.fi. There's links in the description of this video. Now back to our story. Okay, and speaking of uh, decentralization, can you get more into the, the specifics for uh, BASE right now and, and how you're planning to uh, you know further decentralize in the future? Like, um, so more on kind of the technical side of, of base, like you're you're using OP stack. So that's mm -hmm. that's kind of um, you know the like uh, tools to to yep. build a technical stack for base is based on on that. Um, but it's its own network. Is is that right? And but is it is it right now? Is it controlled? solely by Coinbase or like what's the, the deal there? Yeah, you're getting on the right questions. Um, <laughs> so base is a stage zero roll up in the stage zero, stage one, stage two. That means there's still a lot of training wheels. Um, uh, and we're going to be progressing to stage one and stage two over the next year. Um, that said, we've worked really intentionally um, to ensure that base is like sufficiently decentralized at the start to remain open and permissionless. Um, and then that we have a really clear plan for further decentralizing. Um, and so on that kind of sufficient decentralization, uh, we've worked really closely with Optimism to um, configure the network in terms of the uh, way upgrades happen, uh, in, in terms of the way uh, kind of challenges for potential fault proofs happen, um, such that there's no single point of failure. And that Coinbase is not a single point of failure. So that was really important to us. Uh, we did not want Coinbase to be able to unilaterally upgrade base. We didn't want Coinbase to be able to unilaterally challenge uh, withdrawals from base um, because it felt like it was just putting too much centralization risk into the network. And we wouldn't actually be able to live up to our commitment around the kind of decentralized, open, permissionless block space that we think is really important. So that's kind of the starting point. In terms of where we go from here, uh, we have three kind of really big focuses and commitments. Um, the first is we've been working for the last nine months um, with optimism on uh, this open neutrality framework uh, called the law of chains. Uh, it basically defines kind of what is that open permissionless nature of base and other OP stack chains? Um, how do we ensure that it's protected? How do we ensure that users are kind of given uh, kind of protections to use it? Um, developers, the same thing. And, and how do we also make sure that the chains that are part of this uh, have kind of sufficient rights and, and sufficient protections in, in the overall super chain? And so that uh, is a kind of living document. We just open sourced it, the V0.1. Um, we're getting a lot of great community feedback. And then it's going to be brought through OP governance, um, which will uh, kind of ratify it uh, and base will remain committed to it. And so that's the first thing is kind of committing to this neutrality framework that's going to ensure that base remains open and permissionless. Um, mm -hmm. The second big thing on decentralization is technical decentralization. Uh, and that's a place where we're investing a lot of resources right now. Uh, so we have a whole engineering team that's just working on decentralizing the OP stack. Uh, from the uh, security council that's being designed uh, for kind of next generation upgrades um, to fault proofs, um, which we're working on uh, two implementations of in parallel, um, one in the GET stack uh, and one in the REST stack, um, uh, to a bunch of other investments that we've made uh, in security, scalability. Um, we just published this really cool open source framework called Pessimism, Optimism, mm -hmm. Pessimism, um, which, uh, you know, is starting to be adopted by a bunch of other OP stack chains. And it's kind of like our best in class monitoring out of the, the Coinbase protocol security team. Um, so that's the second big commitment uh, is a commitment in technical uh, in investments in decentralization. And then I'd say the third big kind of commitment on decentralization is funding, uh, creating sustainable funding source for the underlying technology that the infrastructure, the, the resources that enable uh, base and the OP stack to decentralize. And so um, on that on that angle, we've committed a portion of uh, all of base's sequencer uh, fees to funding public goods mm -hmm. through the Optimism Collective. And we really see that as 
uh, a pipeline through which we can ensure that we continue to make progress. Um, independent of Coinbase, uh, independent of base, um, there's a way that uh, folks are going to be able to get the resources they need in order to continue decentralizing the crypto economy. So um, the neutrality framework, uh, the technical investments that we're making, and then the funding investments that we're making uh, all kind of combine together to put us on a really sure path uh, to further increase basis decentralization and the decentralization of other OP stack chains over the next couple of years. Super interesting. Um, okay, so with on the uh, technical decentralization, does that include um, how like the sequencer is, is run? Like I understand the sequencer is a big part of like yeah. technically decentralizing layer twos. What's yeah. the plan? Yeah, so sequencer decentralization is uh, important uh, kind of priority. I will say like the way layer twos are designed, um, uh, they are built to, to be um, pretty resilient to having a single sequencer. Uh, and in particular, that's because there's mechanisms on Ethereum layer one, where even if the sequencer is misbehaving, anyone can still submit a transaction to the rollout. That's just kind of enforced at the protocol level. And so let's say Coinbase wanted to, you know, block a transaction at the sequencer level. There'd still be a way to get that into um, the, the, the chain um, by using L1 forced inclusion. Um, and what that means is it means that um, you can kind of uh, have a single sequencer, but still get all of the, the decentralization of Ethereum. Now, obviously, there's, there's trade-offs, there's drawbacks. Um, and that's why we're working on further decentralization, but it's a really strong starting point that's different than if we were just kind of a layer one where there's just one node that was running the chain. Um, so that's the starting point. You know, base is already pretty decentralized and layer twos are built explicitly so that having a single sequencer uh, doesn't kind of uh, compromise that. In terms of broader sequencer decentralization, our approach here um, is you know, one that embraces kind of open source and, and, and contributions from a broader community. So uh, a few months ago, the Optimism Foundation published a request for proposals um, asking basically for uh, you know, contributors to implement the first stage of sequencer decentralization, uh, which is called the leader election protocol. Um, basically says, hey, if we were going to have many sequencers, how would we uh, figure out which one is sequencing a given block? Um, we saw a bunch of great applications uh, from different teams to, to for that uh, proposal. Um, and we ultimately um, had the foundation, the foundation picked um, Espresso Systems, which is a really like incredible team um, led by Ben Fish and Joe Welzer, um, who uh, have been working and researching decentralized sequencing for last year. And so they are being given a grant. Um, they are working on kind of the first prototype of that leader election protocol. Um, and that's kind of the first stepping stone towards a more decentralized uh, sequencer, sequencer set uh, for base and for other OP stack chains. And so I think that's a great example of kind of what the OP stack enables. It's like we've built an open source public good modular technology stack. And then other folks are being able to kind of build components that can plug in and that can work with it to make it better. Uh, and that's going to enable us to uh, continually kind of upgrade and improve the underlying infrastructure that's scaling base, scaling other OP stack chains and, and making the whole crypto economy happen. The funding aspect is super interesting as well. So it's um, the, the sequencer, uh, I guess, like charges fees for uh, the transactions that it's approving. Mm -hmm. And so you're planning mm -hmm. on using part of those fees to incentivize uh, more uh, uh, sequencers? Uh, not necessarily incentivize more sequencers, although when there's decentralized sequencing, that's how it will work. But in the short term, what we're doing is we're basically um, committing a portion of those fees to fund uh, public goods like investment, um, basically. So to, to kind of put into the retroactive public goods funding model that Optimism has been standing up uh, and support builders and you know creatives and other folks who are you know making based and the OP stack possible. So that kind of replaces the um, the need for a token. Obviously in crypto, you know that's always going to be a big question. Um, yeah. So is is that right? Like that's uh, how you can bypass I, the token? I don't know if like you know replaces whatever you know. I think you know Optimism, for instance, has a token, but their uh, OP main networks in exactly the same way. So I don't think it's an either or. Um, but I, I do think that this is one, you know, sustainable funding source, uh, that enables us to contribute back. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I guess I don't, I, I don't, I don't really see them as connected, but, um, we're really definitely excited about, uh, having a way to make sure that this, uh, key critical infrastructure work continues being funded. What's in it for Coinbase? So I, I, I get kind of what you said before that, you know, the, the reason why you're building 
uh, this is because you want to plug in like all the different use cases that are on chain that Coinbase is, is, is building. But um, is there a way that this also uh, fits into like Coinbase's business model? Like does Coinbase make money off of Base somehow? Yeah, so I'd say the the primary Coinbase uh, like mental model for making revenue off of Base is if you look at Coinbase historically, the way we've made money is we've made it really easy for people to do things with crypto. And that's primarily been kind of trading, saving, uh, staking. And then uh, because we're providing a trusted, safe experience, uh, everyday folks have been willing to kind of pay us for that, right? They value the, the ease of use. They value the trust. Um, and I think we see a similar opportunity with Coinbase and Base, where Base is going to enable kind of the next wave of use cases. Uh, instead of having just trading, just saving, just staking, we're now going to have hundreds of things that people can do on chain. And Coinbase is going to continue to be that gateway uh, that enables people to do those things. And that's going to be uh, a way of uh, kind of Coinbase earning revenue because folks are going to be excited about you know using that trusted gateway. And so I think we really see Base as an investment in innovation um, and an investment in enabling those use cases, which down the line, Coinbase can... Um, you know, benefit from uh, because the pie is going to grow so much over the next few years as everyone comes on chain. Speaking of uh, like going on chain, you have this whole campaign on chain summer. If if you want to uh, talk a bit about uh, about that, yeah, absolutely. We, um, you know, as we were thinking about launching base, I think kind of in parallel, we started seeing that there was just so much activity starting to happen on chain this summer. You know, if you look at the chart of L2 transactions or the, the value locked in L2s, it's just up and to the right. It's one of the most kind of consistent growth curves I've ever seen in crypto. Um, and it's all really coming to a head this summer where we're starting to see new use cases, whether it's, you know, media on chain or it's uh, music on chain or it's gaming on chain or it's food on chain. All of these things are finally starting to become possible. And so I think as we, we thought about how we wanted to bring base to market, um, I think a lot of our feeling was we want to tell that story and we want to help to tell, help the world tell the story. We want to help amplify what's already happening with our voice, with our platform. And so that's what on chain summer is. Um, what we're doing is every day starting, uh, on August 9th, all the way through the end of the month. Uh, you can find one fun, cool thing to do on chain, um, at onchainsummer.xyz, uh, or you can just Google on chain summer and it'll show up at the top of your results. Uh, and that's going to be a mix of things. Uh, there's going to be some cool art. There's going to be some cool music. There's going to be, uh, some cool games. There's going to be some cool, like physical collectibles that, you know, you mint and then redeem. Uh, there's going to be some cool community projects that you can support. Um, and our hope is that, you know, for the everyday person who is just getting kind of familiar with crypto, get, just getting familiar with this concept of on-chain, they find one thing that gets them excited. And I think our, our bet is that if everyone can find one thing that gets them excited, that's going to be a catalyst to get them a wallet and to get them to do their first transaction uh, and to get them to really have their first experience of what this next generation of the internet is. And that if we give them that taste that will be kind of the gateway that gets them to explore more, gets them to start building and gets them to, to join the movement of people who are coming on chain. And so um, it's not, it's not just about base. Uh, it's really about all of us uh, trying to find those magic moments for the everyday per person who is trying to find their way on chain. So yeah, that's what on chain summer is all about. Nice. Um, and I want to talk about uh, the activity that has been happening on on base. Uh, you know, this past few weeks because you had, yeah. you know, base was open for developers before this uh, just like public launch. There was a ton of activity. Um, there's this June dashboard that shows how much. Uh, I don't know. It was like a hundred million right? Or something like mm -hmm. that was uh, bridged uh, already. Um, and a lot of that, uh, w a lot of that was around meme coin uh, trading. Um, so, you know, crypto being crypto, it is what it is. <laughs> a lot of people are just here to, you know, speculate. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, there there was a rug pull with this one meme coin. Um, one of the dexes on on a base a lead swap a, was exploited. Uh, so you know, obviously, very early days a, on on base. But 
you know, th there were these, you know, first couple like big headlines, unfortunately, had to do with rocks and exploits. Um, of course, you can't control that. But yep. um, as a company, like, do you what do you do about this? Like, do yeah, you just like question. do nothing or do you want to like try to ease people who might be turned off or like, yeah, like how do you? handle these situations? Yeah, great question. Um, I think j just to kind of put it out there, uh, you know, in the open, like base is an open permissionless network. Um, and that means that there's going to be um, a ton of uh, different kinds of creativity that people explore on base. Um, and, uh, you know, that's been happening on other open permissionless networks like Ethereum for a while. Um, and, you know, our goal is to be deliberate, to be thoughtful and, and to move really methodically. And so, you know, when we decided, when we were thinking about how we wanted to launch base, um, we kind of thought of this multi-phase process. First, we'd open it up for developers um, so they could kind of build, deploy their dApps, get uh, kind of familiar. And we could also just make sure that everything was working well. Then we'd open it up for bridging so that people could start moving some funds in. And then finally, we'd open it up for everyone and everything. And tomorrow's the day we open up for everyone and everything. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of started that plan in July. Uh, you know, we're, we're onboarding developers. And then I think last Sunday, um, I woke up and was like, oh, the people are here um, uh, and they're kind of doing some, some experimental things. And uh, it was it was just a reminder, I think, for all of us of like, oh, yeah, we can have our best laid plans. Um, but because this is an open permissionless network, sometimes those plans are going to change. Um, and that is just crypto. Uh, and so I think how we think about this is that base is going to continue to kind of live in that crypto reality. It's going to continue to be open. It's going to continue to be permissionless. It's going to continue to extend the decentralization that Ethereum has created and ensure that we have uh, a platform that can really support an open global economy. At the same time, Coinbase is going to continue being the kind of trusted interface for everyday people. And so what that means is there's probably going to be a lot of chaos on base at times. You know, there's going to be people doing things that are a little out there. Um, and if you're just going like raw straight into base, um, you know, you should do your own research, you know, <laughs> you know, put your uh, kind of hat on, uh, your thinking hat on and make sure that you're being thoughtful, you're being deliberate. Um, and if you're maybe uh, not quite ready for that, access base through Coinbase. Uh, Coinbase is going to continue having our ratings and reviews, which kind of, uh, you know, tell folks which dApps are trustworthy, which assets are trustworthy. Uh, we're going to continue building kind of monitoring and alerting tools so that if you're interacting with something and it seems fishy, we'll flag it to you before you can even do something that could put you at risk. Um, and Coinbase is going to continue creating that trusted context, curated context a little bit more, where people can know that when they're doing something, it's a good idea for them to do it. Uh, and so that kind of balance of having the open permissionless space where creativity can flourish, but then also having uh, kind of the more hands-on um, curatorial space where folks can really know that they, they're transacting with confidence, um, with trust. Um, I think that's kind of the world that the base and Coinbase are going to operate in. Yeah, I think that's a good framework. It's, yeah, base is permissionless and people will be able to build whatever they want, but uh, Coinbase can uh, be a bit of a guide in, in this uh, Wild West. 100%. And that's the way it's always been, right? Like uh, Coinbase has always been a guide, whether you were transacting on Ethereum or Bitcoin or Solana. Um, or other layer twos. Um, that's the role that Coinbase has played. Uh, now just base is one more uh, of those places that Coinbase can guide you. I'm wondering whether, you know, the fact that Coinbase is, you know, an exchange that can be a bridge into base, will there be any favoritism or ways in where like Coinbase is favored uh, over other uh, centralized exchanges? Connecting to base? No, definitely not. You know, ba again, base is open and permissionless. Anyone can connect into base. Uh, if you want to run a base node, you can just go to base.org. Uh, if you want to participate in the network, you can. You can bridge from Ethereum. Uh, you can bridge from other uh, layer twos, other centralized exchanges. So there's definitely not going to be any uh, kind of favoritism from base to, to Coinbase. Now, since then, reverse. Um, you know, I think when we look at Coinbase, uh, from the Coinbase perspective, um, you know, today, I think uh, consumers who are kind of wanting to use apps on chain, um, they're presented often with like a ton of choices before they can even transact. It's like, oh, I want to use this app. Now, where do I want to run the app? And that's a pretty complex decision set. And so I think what we're going to gradually do is figure out 
how do we um, make base a really kind of safe, easy to use, low cost, trusted default for folks? So for the average person who just wants to use a stable coin or just wants to um, borrow some money or just wants to, to swap something, um, they can uh, do that in a really easy, low cost way uh, and have that be powered by uh, base. Uh, and so that, you know, that's going to take some time. Um, you're still going to be able to use Coinbase products everywhere. Um, you're still going to be able to access all these chains, um, but making it so that uh, everyday users have a really clear path to going from never having interacted on chain before to doing something that they really care about in less than 60 seconds. That's kind of our North Star and priority. Right. Okay. So the, the inverse uh, means that so Coinbase isn't going to be favored on base, but Coinbase will likely favor base as the layer two that people use for, you know, different uh, dApps. Yeah, I think just making kind of sane default choices that uh, enable users to have a safe, easy to use, low cost experience. That's what we'll be focused on. Oh, and speaking of low cost, I'm uh, remembering something you mentioned earlier. Um, the fact that you said uh, layer twos are still not uh, cheap enough. Uh, yeah. Just like, yeah, interested to uh, talk more about that. Like, um, yeah, what's what's kind of why why do you think they're not cheap enough, and what does this new EIP do to improve that? Generally, my kind of like threshold for where I think will be cheap enough is if we can get the average transaction fee down sub cent. Like if we can get transaction fees less than a cent, I think at that point, it basically for kind of everyone around the world becomes pretty achievable to do a very large number, a significant number of transactions a day. Um, at a dollar or five dollars, that's clearly not the case, right? There's people who are earning, you know, one to two dollars a day. Lots of people all over the world who are earning one to two dollars a day. And so, and then at 10 cents, you know, you know, like right now, if you do a transaction, send ETH on someone, it's like three to five cents. Um, if you do a swap, it's like 20, 20 cents, 20, 30 cents. Um, I, I still think that's like, it's close, but it's not quite there. That's on base. It's like 10 cents. Yeah. 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 And other, and other L2s. Um, uh, so for, for like, you know, a lot of people in the world, that's a fair amount of money. And so I, I basically think we need to get another order of magnitude, uh, fee reduction, and not only do we need to do that, we need to um, sustain that as the number of transactions increases. And so we need to kind of continually be driving down uh, cost and increasing capacity so that as we onboard, you know, millions and then tens of millions and then hundreds of millions and then billions of people, we can keep those fees really low. So that's my North Star. It's less than one cent per transaction. Um, in terms of uh, kind of how we get there. Uh, the next big milestone uh, for base and for other Ethereum layer twos is this upgrade called EIP4844 or proto dank sharding. Um, it's an upgrade to Ethereum that we've been working on for almost a year and a half at this point. Uh, and what it does is it kind of creates a new type of storage on Ethereum that's purpose built for layer twos. So right now they're kind of using standard Ethereum block space and it's not really what it's supposed to be used for, which means that's too expensive means that it's very variable depending on kind of the activity on Ethereum. And what EIP4844 will do is it's going to create a new thing called blob space, which is like meant for rollups to post their data and layers twos to post their data. So that's going to mean it can be priced correctly, which will drive down the costs a lot. And then it also means that um, there's going to be a separate market. So the kind of demand pricing mechanisms only apply to blob space rather than kind of sharing the demand pricing mechanisms with Ethereum, where maybe if like you have a big price spike, Uniswap is using a ton of block space and that's pricing out layer twos. And so that's going to lead to lower costs uh, in terms of uh, kind of layer two fees and much more consistency. So basically like you're going to see less spikes in layer two fees. Um, instead, they'll be pretty, pretty uh, consistent. So it's, uh, you know, the centerpiece of the next Ethereum upgrade uh, Denkun, which is the name of the Ethereum upgrade. Um, I think it's going to happen sometime late this year, early next year. Uh, teams are working hard on it. Um, a lot of progress has been made. Uh, we're in the, I think, like seventh or eighth DevNet uh, with it, which is, you know, a, a pretty far along. Um, and we'll probably do a couple more of those um, before we move on to test nets in the mainnet. Does that get transaction cost to, to a cent? We'll see. I think it's going to get us another kind of like five to 10 X reduction. Um, a lot of it's going to be dependent on how much demand there is. So this creates the blob space and it um, gives us like a certain amount of capacity every block. 
Um, but if we were to fill up that capacity, then we'd start having higher fees again. And so, you know, what's going to happen over the next year is that we're, we're going to release EIP 4844. And then we're going to gradually tune up the capacity. So we start with X capacity and then we have 2X capacity and then we have 4X capacity and then we have 8X capacity and then we have 16X capacity. And that's going to happen every kind of like six to nine months, maybe longer um, over the next few years. Um, And so the question of like, what exactly are the feeds going to be when we launch this are a function of um, how much capacity are we going to have, which we know, but then it's also going to be a function of how much capacity our rollups going to use, which we don't know. Um, because it's a function of how much activity is there on rollups. And if you look at, at layer twos and their growth over the last while, they're just going up, going up and to the right really consistently. And so um, it may be that we launch this and we get fees down subset and then they kind of creep back up. Um, yeah, we're going to have to see. But I think we're going to get a, a really sizable reduction, uh, which will bring fees much closer to sub one cent. I don't know if they'll exactly get that, um, but they'll be closer. Super interesting. Um, okay, and then you've mentioned this North Star of the billion users on chain. Um, I love your your thoughts on why that's so important. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, why is being on chain um, uh, just like the, the goal to be going after? I think we basically think about on chain as the next generation of the internet, um, where before before the internet, like we were all offline. Uh, and we were mostly talked at. Everything was one way. Like you could read the newspaper, you could watch the television, but you couldn't create. Uh, like that was gatekept by the producers, by the, you know, whoever, the editors. Um, and then the internet came. And for the first time, all of us could kind of share with the world. We could create for the world. But when we did create, our, our content, our work ended up owned by other people, locked in other people's platforms who set the rules. And I think we see on-chain as the next generation where we can read, we can write, we can also own. And everything that we create uh, and we put it on-chain, uh, it stays ours. And that means that we can benefit from its value. We can earn more of the, the, the proceeds from it. We can uh, have more control over our data. Uh, we can have more meaningful connections and relationships with the people who engage with it um, rather than being kind of intermediated by some other kind of large corporation. And so... When I talk to individuals and I, and, I talk, and I hear folks talk about how moving on chain has changed their lives, whether they're an artist or someone who's building games, the, the most common thing that I hear is I moved on chain. And I'm never going back mm-hmm. because here, like, I, I feel like I can own my own destiny. I feel like the things that I create are finally mine. Um, I feel like I can set my course and I can actually kind of determine where I'm going rather than being taken around by these outside forces that are bigger than me. And I think that feeling, that feeling of autonomy, that feeling of sovereignty, and the outcomes that come from that feeling, which is increased economic freedom um, and, and kind of having everyone on a level playing field, that's why it's so important we get a billion people on chain. Because when we have a billion people on chain, it's not just going to be anecdotal data that says, oh, wow, this changed my life and I'm here to stay. It's going to be the world experiencing that. And the world mm-hmm. benefiting from it in increased creativity, in increased economic freedom, um, in increased income, in increased happiness, uh, in, in the world just being a better place. Because these systems uh, that we have been operating in for the last many years have been powerful, but they've also been broken. And it's time to upgrade the system. And on chain is that upgrade that's kind of sweeping through the world. Uh, I, I love that uh, optimistic vision. Um, how close do you think we are to that future? <laughs> To a billion people, <laughs> I'm I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist. Um, you know, I think it's probably going to happen faster and slower than I expect. Um, we'll look back at the end of the decade and we'll be like, "Wow, that happened fast." But um, I, I I think it'll happen this decade. Uh, whether it happens by you know 2025 or 2027 or 2024, I'm not sure. I do think that um, there is a little bit of like we're all a little bit conditioned by the last 10, 12 years of crypto where everything's been kind of flat and then punctuated by speculative kind of uh, increases, which then damp, damp, tamp down again. Like that's not really how other products and platforms have worked. Like with a consumer product like TikTok or, or ChatGPT, like once you, you grow and then it grows really quickly. Um, and uh, I don't think we've really seen that inflection point yet in crypto. And so I expect sometime in the next few years, we're going to start kind of that growth curve where it's like, oh, now these products really work. 
like now it's actually, you know, intuitive and better for everyone or, you know, some large subset of people to do this thing on chain. And once that happens, I think we'll start seeing basically like consistent month over month, quarter over quarter growth. And we won't stop until everyone's on chain. Uh, and I think that that starting point is going to happen sooner than people expect. It maybe already happened. Um, uh, just in the last six to 12 months, like it may be that this growth that we're starting to see on layer twos just isn't going to stop. Um, we'll, we'll know more, uh, as we kind of watch it all happen, but I'm pretty optimistic. We shall see. I think, I think you're right that we haven't really seen, uh, that inflection point in crypto. And it's, it's just, there, there has just been too much to build, like from like literally re remaking how everything works from the ground up, you know, just mm -hmm. like from the, the networks to like payments to like currency, um, UX storage, like everything needs to be rebuilt. So, um, yeah, it's, it's taken some time, but. Yeah, I agree that like once everything clicks together, then there's like no, no stopping it. Yep. Well, we've been building for a while and we've been creating some pretty powerful infrastructure. And now it's time to go use it to build some really awesome use cases. So it's on chain summer. I think it's here. Uh, I'm super fired up about it. Uh, I hope everyone gets on chain this summer. You can get started on onchainsummer.xyz. Um, and uh, I'm optimistic that we'll bring a billion people on chain sooner rather than later. Awesome. Okay. I think that's a great place to, to wrap up. Uh, Jesse, thank you so much for joining me. This was a super interesting conversation. Um, and yeah, we'll be watching to see how uh, base um, develops after the launch. Excited to see. Awesome. And yeah, awesome. hope to see everyone on chain as well. <laughs> Thanks, Camilla.